Uh, can you hear me? Um, uh, good afternoon to everybody and thanks for having me. And uh, I'm going to be talking about how the understanding on posterior puncture headache would help us manage this uh, condition better. Talk about things that are not often talked about in the text. So I'd focus more on the management strategies. Uh, on, and as for the definition, you know, it's uh, everybody knows it's uh, often a sphere headache that starts with the uh, patient sitting up uh, and uh, is initiated within 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, often we have uh, a noticed dural puncture pr uh, preceding this headache. And most commonly, this headache would start within five days of the puncture. And however, there have been reports, those have reported uh, even after years. Uh, the last one I saw actually was very strange, was people have reported it after 10 years, and this was uh, evaluated based on imaging. However, uh, it would be very uncommon uh, to have that after so many uh, years. It's most often within day five uh, that the headache would start. It's a very interesting history, although I'm not uh, very, uh, a lot, I'm not a fan of history, but it's a very interesting story how this was discovered, uh, since we are supposed to talk about a little bit of the past as well. Uh, in this was uh, when the spinal anesthetic was being discovered by August Beyer, who was a surgeon. He and his student were practicing spinal anesthetics and uh, uh, Bayer had his student perform a spinal on him who eventually lost a lot of uh, uh, CSF. Uh, Bayer got really angry, but uh, next day he was, uh, they, they reversed the role and uh, he was performing a spinal on his student. Uh, when he also lost a lot of CSF and eventually both of them developed a, a post puncture headache and uh, they were actually able to talk about the physiology behind this, what caused this. Uh, importantly, uh, one should understand the symptoms to make a good diagnosis here. And uh, the commonest diagnosis, uh, the commonest symptom would be a postural headache, rest, everything. You could have mucor rigidity, vomiting, or uh, visual or auditory changes. Patients often, when you walk into their room, who've got actually postural puncture headache, would be, you know, would have turned off the lights, would want uh, to be quiet. It's just because all these things. Uh, uh, make their pain worse. I would focus more on how, you know, this is initiated and there, what is so far thought on this process is that uh, when the CSF is lost, since the cranium has a fixed volume, in order to accommodate for the volume loss, the cerebral vessels dilate. And uh, uh, this is one mechanism that causes more pressure around the, the vessels. And also when the brain sags, it causes uh, traction on the neural structures and uh, typically symptoms of uh, a stretch of C1 to C3 nerves are seen. Uh, how the symptoms are presented really depend on what we understand uh, on this. So for pain uh, for in the brain, there are only two pain related structures, basically pain sensing structures. One is the meninges and the other is the perivascular adventitia along with uh, the cranial nerves. So if one looks at uh, the position when the patient sits up, uh, one should see that actually the cranium is not horizontal. So when the patient sits up, basically the dura up here is pulled the most. And actually when the brain sags, it actually causes most pressure on the occipital side. As a result, when you see the, when the patient reports, they typically report a frontal occipital headache because there's a pull on the frontal and, and a push or a pressure on the occipital side. Uh, occasionally, you would have temple uh, involvement as well, but most often it's the frontal uh, uh, frontal occipital headache. The other thing that often is not talked about and is not quizzed from the patient when we talk about uh, what kind of headache they have is uh, they will typically report a vascular rush when they sit up. This is this happens because, like I said. Uh, when the CSF has been lost, uh, the brain sags and the cranium volume does, the cranium has a fixed volume in order to accommodate that the vessels expand and there is an increased blood flow and the patients would not only report uh, headache onset and they will often say vascular rush. This actually is a good giveaway for a differential diagnosis. Uh, I would only talk about factors those we have uh, very strong evidence on uh, that influence the, uh, uh, the posterior puncture headache. And uh, the first one is basically gender. So studies have reported that uh, somewhere around 15 to 50% increase in case of females. And uh, this has probably got to do one probably with uh, lower pain, pain thresholds or the estrogenic uh, stimulus causing more vasodilation. And uh, 
presenting as uh, more headache because of the perivascular structures uh, uh, being dilated. Uh, how is this related to uh, obstetric population? In fact, is one of the commonest uh, complications in obstetric uh, anesthesiology, people getting uh, labor epidurals. Uh, as such, there was, there's, it, there's not a direct correlation that has been found that, you know, maybe uh, OB population is more. However, when the laboring stage, when the second stage of labor is there, then there is a, a prolonged second stage of labor or patients who've actually had been pushing, they apparently have a higher incidence of posterior puncture headache. And age is again a, a factor that influences and unfortunately the laboring women actually fall in the category where this incidence is the highest. And uh, it actually, the incidence changes between uh, after around 50 to 60 years, it's much lower. Uh, this again, the age correlation is actually has been shown that uh, it peaks at around maybe 30 to 40 years, which is when he, uh, uh, most of the laboring women will be there. Uh, obesity, in fact, is uh, protective and we see a lot of obese uh, patients in the West. Uh, it's probably because the epidural fat uh, content also goes up. And when you've got a dual puncture, what is basically happening is you're established, you've established a fistula between the intrathecal space and the epidural space, the higher the pressure in the epidural space, the less, uh, uh, the less uh, gradient exists between where the CSF leak is happening and this may be protective. Uh, and obesity itself may be an inflammatory st uh, state which uh, helps seal the dural uh, uh, hole as well. What is, uh, in terms of uh, differentials, one must uh, rule out meningitis, uh, although meningitis typically would set in only after 24 to 48 hours and you would often have fever with this. Uh, the reason I highlight meningitis more than others is because the treatment is time sensitive and uh, you would need to initiate antibiotics as soon as possible. Whereas, you know, the other uh, complications, other, other possibilities like nicotine withdrawal is actually seen a lot in the West uh, and not as much in India. And uh, these are the dreaded complications that may eventually even follow uh, uh, the posterior puncture headache if uh, not treated. Because as I talked about dura being sagging, uh, dura, uh, the brain sagging, it could actually pull on the emissary veins and cause uh, bleeding. One thing that is talked about in a lot is the needle type and the postural puncture headache. And in fact, this is one of the biggest modifiable factors uh, that we can work on. And our group, uh, we worked on some, uh, we worked on a network on uh, a network meta-analysis looking at all the needles uh, available used to perform uh, they, they, they used to perform spinal anesthetics. And uh, uh, I'll briefly describe what is going on here. Uh, a, a, a is the atraumatic needle and C is a cutting type needle. So what we basically, these pink dots basically represent the type of the needle and the connection is the, the direct comparison between the types of the needle. For example, uh, 24A would be a 24 gauge atraumatic needle compared with a 26 gauge uh, cutting needle. And we have three direct trials evaluating them. It seems like a very busy figure, but uh, since we had a lot of needles, this in fact, uh, uh, other than the posterior puncture headache, we actually were able to compare patients uh, from uh, roughly uh, from 61 RCTs of 15,000 patients who had uh, been evaluated for posterior puncture headache. Uh, we evaluated back failure, uh, uh, failure rate and back pain rate. It is important to understand uh, uh, why the secondary outcome help were used. Uh, because if one looks at uh, the needle gauge, one would think that the finest needle might actually be the best. However, uh, our results were uh, a little unusual that uh, the, this is a rank table here. Uh, the more dark blue you see here, the better the needle typed for, or the less the incidence of posterior puncture headache. So if you see uh, the highest uh, amount of dark blue actually is in 26A and not in 27A or not even 27, 29C, which, uh, which was a bit odd finding that in fact, that uh, the finest needle was probably not associated with the lowest incidence of posterior puncture headache. I engage was probably associated with the highest failure rate, which means that people took multiple attempts just because it was such a finer needle that you may have had uh, uh, more and more dry taps and would have made more dural holes.
So what we want to highlight is that probably you maximize the benefit uh, for the needle type that you're going to be using is that maybe 25 to 26 gauge uh, would be better so as to avoid failure and then having recurrent attempts. A lot that has changed in our understanding on how these needles, uh, uh, why the needles, different types would have different uh, sort of uh, post puncture headache rates. And uh, a couple of years ago, people used to believe that the dural fibers would run in parallel, but this is electron microscopy for dural fibers. And we see that they're all, they run randomly. So when initial thought was there that when we use the pencil point needle, we actually separate out the parallel dural fibers and with the cutting needle, you cut them. As a result, you leave a hole with the cutting needle. However, there have been, there have been multiple studies now who've actually looked at the uh, the dural hole with the presence of in, uh, the electron microscopy. And uh, the analogy is that, you know, actually pencil point causes more traumatic dur dural rent uh, than quinky. And it's something similar here. You know, it's like you're making a hole in paper with a, a cylinder, which is blunt, which is your pencil point and a cutting one. So how does it really explain what we see? Uh, the physiology actually is, uh, the physiology actually is that uh, the inflammatory reaction seals off the dural hole. So here, it's gonna be much more inflammatory reaction, very little inflammatory reaction here. So as a result, this hole seals faster than this. And what we see is actually not uh, based on, you know, dual fiber separation, but is actually inflammatory uh, uh, response. And this was actually demonstrated by this study that I've uh, cited here. Uh, again, you know, not only does the uh, the type of needle influence uh, the the incidence of posterior puncture headache, but I've got uh, an, a study where they actually compared the 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 number of uh, the number of people who got the blood patch, which indirectly would be a marker of the severity of the disease. So if you see that Quinky, for example, which is a cutting needle, not only was associated with the highest incidence of posterior puncture headache, but had the highest percentage of blood patch as well. So all the cutting needles definitely would be associated with higher incidence, but also more severe uh, uh, posterior puncture headache, eventually leading on to the requirement of blood patch. Uh, this, uh, again, uh, going back to the thought that if uh, cutting needles were less traumatic, okay, then would, and dural fibers do not run in, uh, dural fibers do not run in parallel as we initially thought, then would parallel or perpendicular orientation actually make a difference? And there, there it's, there's another study that actually looked at the electron microscopy and found that the dural rents are very similar and the incidence of uh, a posterior puncture headache with the orientation probably does not make much of a difference. The original evidence actually came from a study that was done in 1946. There's another study that looked at this in 2018 as well. Uh, however, the evidence is very poor to actually support whether the needle orientation actually makes a huge difference. Uh, the other thing that we often uh, have uh, often get stuck with is when we have a wet tap uh, with an epidural needle, what should we be doing and how can we minimize the chances of further a uh, patient developing a posterior puncture headache? And this can be, there's a very interesting study that was uh, conducted in Cleveland Clinic, and they actually had uh, patients divided into three groups. So first group where they had a dual tap, they said, okay, let's withdraw the needle and we put in the epidural catheter in a different uh, site. In the second group, they did put in the intrathecal catheter and remove the catheter right after the delivery. And then the other, the third group actually had the catheter in place for 24 hours. They may not have used the catheter, but they left it. Uh, they left the catheter in place. Uh, and what we see is again very interesting that as you leave the catheter, not only the incidence of PDPH is lower, but the severity, which is indicated by possibly the blood patch requirement, was also lower. This again is explained by the same fact that it's the inflammatory reaction that leads to uh, leads to the sealing of the hole and actually. Uh, uh, it's uh, one would rather argue that you know if you leave a catheter, you could actually establish a track. However, uh, you're causing this inflammatory reaction that actually fills up the hole. And uh, the use of uh, uh, the the catheter being left in has been revalidated in multiple meta-analyses, and it does seem to really uh, work. This is I've only got the graphic here for uh, the incidence of posterior puncture headache where the benefit was marginal. 
However, if the number of uh, patients getting blood patch was compared, it's even significantly better if you leave the catheter in. And again, uh, the reason, I mean, uh, uh, why we deviated from the conventional thought that is actually the dural, uh, less traumatic dural thing uh, that causes uh, the sealing of the hole is because first of all, dural, uh, the, the dura itself is just collagen and is in, incapable of generating fibroblasts. So the actual healing happens by the generation of fibroblasts, which can only come from a cellular layer, which apparently dural tissue is not really cellular. So it had to be in, uh, it had to be a uh, dual tissue actually is incapable of healing itself. It needs the cellular components of the arachnoid matter to fix the problem. And which again is helped by inflammatory reaction. Again, the evidence was further supported that uh, uh, the generation of blood patch actually happened when people noticed early on that uh, bloody taps were associated with lower incidence of post puncture headache. So blood and inflammatory reaction at the site uh, does help seal and fix the problem rather than what was conventionally thought. Uh, so again, you know, what are the modifiable factors? Uh, minimize the attempts. These would be use uh, somebody who's more experienced, but uh, this may not be possible in teaching institutes where you have to help the residents uh, learn the process. Pencil point needles are preferred. Smaller gauge needles, probably you max out benefits at 26, 25 gauge and uh, leave the catheter in, okay. Uh, very briefly, I'll talk about the differential here before we actually start treating the problem. The differential one that is time sensitive, like I said, was to rule out meningitis because they would have very similar symptoms uh, uh, of headache, which may not, which would not be postural, but rule out uh, fever and center hemogram. And all these things would help you differentiate uh, the, the uh, postural puncture headache from meningitis. Uh, both meningitis could also present with hyperacusis, tinnitus. Uh, so as a result, you know, if, uh, if you're capable of performing these Koenigs and Brudzinski's, it may be helpful uh, if you have suspicion of meningitis. Before you dwell into the treatment, what is important uh, to understand uh, is that most postural puncture headaches would fix themselves in roughly seven days, okay? Uh, there have been conventional treatments, uh, bed rest. Uh, it, apparently the evidence uh, put together says that, you know, it actually may postpone or make the patients feel a little better, but does it really treat? It's probably not there. In the US, uh, we typically recommend uh, bed rest. However, if you look at papers originating out of the UK, they don't really, they actually, they actually focus on early ambulation and early mobility. Hydration was another thing that was used uh, with an idea that it increases the CSF production. However, meta-analyses put together have not shown any benefit. Abdominal binders uh, probably increase the epidural uh, venous pressure and then decrease the gradient for CSF leak. However, they are themselves very uncomfortable. And imagine a patient with uh, a cesarean section, you put on an abdominal binder. Uh, in terms of analgesics, uh, these are the first line that most often people will end up getting a small dose of uh, NSAIDs with uh, maybe oxycodone is what we use here. Again, uh, before you know, I go further, it is important that most of them we know will resolve in seven days. So our treatment strategy would depend a lot on this. Uh, the other thing that people often has been used is caffeine. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a drug with low therapeutic index the evidence is not very strong. And you can imagine, it's strange that uh, I can remember a patient actually telling me that, you know, you're trying to tell me to go to, uh, to, to rest. And then you give me six cups of coffee a day. You know, it's like uh, uh, strange that uh, once you want somebody to rest, but you give them six cups of coffee, who can, of course they cannot sleep. So I'll talk about a little bit of uh, on the blood patch uh, and it's, uh, it was popularized, it was initially in 19, early 1900s, it uh, came into being, but people, it was not used, and then was repopularized uh, with the, the amount of volumes, what they wanted to use in 1970-72. However, one must know that we are injecting blood that where it's just not supposed to be. It is still the gold standard treatment, it will fix the problem. But remember, it's roughly one third of these patients will have a dragging back pain for at least three months and it could be even worse for some patients and it does cause a, a pretty significant arachnoiditis as well. So we must, weigh the, the we must weigh the benefits and the risks before we perform that, okay? And when, how would you choose whether to do a blood patch or not? Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of text that talks about it and this is what we have been using. Uh, 
so before we choose a patient for, for performing a blood patch and moving on from a conservative therapy to blood patch, we again you know, look at what day is the patient presenting to us. Generally, if early onset uh, post puncture headache is there, we've seen patients even within six hours, they actually become miserable and we've got very low threshold to perform blood patch if it's an early onset uh, post puncture headache. Most headaches uh, we know by, would worsen by day three. So keeping these in mind, supposing you have got a patient with uh, a, a VAS of uh, five presenting at day one versus a patient who presents at uh, day five with a similar pain score, we probably would have a lower threshold to perform a blood patch here versus here because we know that the patient is first passed probably the worst phase of the disease and the the patient here is actually going to become worse over time. And then uh, she's going to be probably more miserable uh, by day one or day two eventually. So as a result, we would definitely perform a blood patch here. We probably would you know, try for conservative therapies here. Uh, if you look at the literature, the, the talk about early blood patch was actually discouraged. However, now it's known that uh, the early, the onset of the post puncture headache the worst headache is going to be there, which means uh, that we were not even comparing like to like. You know, if uh, if I was comparing uh, a blood patch being done at day one versus blood patch being done at day four, the patient who actually got blood patch at day one must have been really worse. And I was not comparing uh, people who were like. So it's like comparing apples to oranges because the disease was not similar. So as a result, uh, uh, when uh, when you look at literature, it says avoid blood patch early, it, it really doesn't make, uh, uh, there's no real good evidence to actually support that. Uh, for people who've actually done a couple of blood patches, they would, they would agree to these uh, findings that uh, I put down. One often thinks the hardest part would be the performing of the epidural, but honestly, these patients who've been hurting, have not been drinking, have not been eating, so they actually are really dehydrated. To get 20 to 30, 20 cc's out of them, in an odd position is actually the hardest part. So when you actually plan for the blood patch, make sure uh, you plan well for the venous access before. Uh, sometimes it may be a good idea to just throw in a cannula before and then connect it with the sterile technique to aspirate once the patient has, uh, once you're in the epidural space. The other, uh, uh, other thing is we often you know, question whether should we be doing this in the sitting position or the lateral position, because you can imagine sitting position makes the patient's position worse. And when you, uh, uh, patients had it worse. And then when you actually sit them up and have them flex, they would hurt a lot more. However, what should get precedence is that, you know, you don't want another dural puncture. So if, if you can do it in lateral position, you're confident, go ahead, uh, do it in lateral position. But if you think the procedure is going to become more difficult in uh, lateral position, you would have to choose, uh, I would recommend choosing a sitting up position. And that's what we most often end up doing for patients in order to make uh, the, position, uh, the, the procedure go faster and is, is relatively easier. Uh, there is uh, a lot of literature that talks about what is a good site for the blood patch because there were concerns that if you did it on the same uh, site, then would you be injecting blood into the intrathecal space? However, the recommendations eventually boil down to that you probably should go down a level lower and there, there's interesting physiology behind it. So if you look at the epidural anatomy, the epidural space is actually much bigger in the lumbar space compared to the thoracic space. So it's like a conical space. So it narrows down thoracical in the thoracic region and is much wider in the lumbar region. So you can imagine injecting fluid into a cone, the, the narrower part would ascend higher and the lower, uh, and it would descend lower in the in the lumbar region. So if you actually injected in a lower uh, uh, level, you would definitely ascend more higher because it's it's narrower volume up top. And the other rationale that the studies have looked at and compared is that uh, epidural space actually is a continuation of uh, the pleural space. So the closer you are to the thoracic space, the more negative pressure you have. So it's likely to rise higher the blood is likely to rise higher than uh, lower. And there's a study that actually did uh, contrast space uh, uh, MRI based studies uh, in cadavers and found that for each segment uh, going uh, down, the blood actually ascended three segments up, which is a pretty significant number. Again, how much volume to inject is uh, something that has been questioned. And uh, 
started early blood patches only started with interestingly only three to five cc's and then they went up to do 20 30 uh, what was realized that uh, there's no difference between 20 cc's and 30 cc's in terms of uh, the resolution of the symptoms however the backache or the retinoiditis or the uh, other symptoms became pretty significant dr preet you have another one minute okay so i'll so I'll, I, I, I'll talk about uh, spinopalatine ganglion block. I, it, it's very commonly that we use this here. And uh, it is something that can be performed uh, without any complications. What, people who perform this, I'd like to tell you that, you know, what you can do is uh, it treats almost all kinds of headaches, not only posterior puncture headache. Uh, it blocks the parasympathetic fibers and hopefully we assume that it only leaves away the sympathetic system fibers, which leads to vasoconstriction and treats the problem, which was because of his dilation. However, is this uh, taking away the protective reflexes? There's no data on that. Uh, we use cosyntropin as well. It has more prophylactic role than therapeutic because of uh, the, uh, because of the studies were probably underpowered to do it. And the last uh, thing I would talk about is what we really, uh, what we really don't know. And these are the questions that we face. Uh, uh, is it really a mechanical headache? Uh, there's a study that actually looked at the, the uh, pressures within the CSF and they found that patients who developed posterior puncture headache were not different from, uh, they had similar CSF pressures with and without posterior puncture headache. So we probably do not understand the physiology as well. And patients with, uh, uh, there is a biochemistry behind it as well. Substance P levels have been shown uh, to be lower in patients with uh, posterior puncture headache. and. Uh, the uh, could you predict posterior puncture headache in after a dual tap? This is a recent trial that actually looked at Dopplers and they looked at the velocity and they were able to predict that really well by using uh, velocities in the uh, the keratids. Okay, and uh, there are innovative techniques. Uh, uh, there's grid occipital block which may come up, and there's even uh, the use of uh, trigger point injections as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prit. It was a nice session and the PDPH you have extensively covered and we will take up the questions. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Echocardiography should be routinely done before all elective cesarean sections. Now, yesterday, a similar uh, session, a pro-con session was there. And uh, in that session, uh, my good friend, Dr. Minakshi uh, Sundaram, he said that Topics for pro concessions are given. All these topics are controversial topics. That's why it is a pro concession. But I don't know why my good friend, Dr. Sunil, has made this mistake of giving a straightforward topic uh, of telling that echocardiography sh should be done in a, in a pro concession. Anyway, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to prove it to you that it is a very, very essential. In our clinical practice, day in and day out, we do a lot of investigations. We do ECGs, X-rays, CT scans, and also, of course, echocardiography. In echocardiography, essentially uses ultrasound waves, which goes through the chest wall most of the times, through the chest wall. It depends on the, on the absorption, reflection, and transmission of these ultrasound waves. And if their characteristics are noted down to see the structural as well as the functional aspects, either normal function of the heart or the abnormalities of the heart are nicely picked up. Now, before asking for any investigation in any clinical situation, any investigation for that matter, we need to ask three questions. Question number one is that whether this investigation is safe in the context of this particular situation or otherwise. Number two, what is the necessity to do this investigation? Am I really justified in asking this investigation? The third one is the availability of the infrastructure, accessibility of that to, of the investigation to the particular patient as well as for the clinician. Now let's see one, one question after the other. Safety. Whether it is obstetric ultrasound or maternal ultrasound, definitely, maternal echo, definitely uses ultrasonography in pregnancy. 
Now, WHO in 2009 made this meta-analysis and on safety of ultrasonography in pregnancy, it, is a, it was a meta-analysis, 61 publications were studied, 16 were RCTs, 13 cohorts and 12 case control studies. And they finally said that ultrasonography in pregnancy it was not associated with any adverse maternal or perinatal outcome. Impaired physical <clears throat> or neurological development, increased risk of malignancy in childhood, anything. So talk of any complication, they said it is, it's not true. And they finally concluded that according to the available evidence, exposure to diagnostic ultrasonography during pregnancy, be it be echocardiography or obstetric ultrasound appears to be very, very safe. So there is a consensus on this. Everybody agrees to it. And I'm sure my good friend, Dr. Sripad Mahendale also agrees to, with me on this issue. So the second one is necessity. Now, just because it is a safe investigation, we need not do any all, all investigations. Yes, there should be a necessity to do it. Now you see, there is a 34-year-old primee with 36 weeks of pregnancy, has shortness of breath at rest, pedal edema, chest pain, palpitations. By the look of it, by the history itself, we know that she has some cardiorespiratory disturbance. Yes, and ECHO is definitely indicated. I'm not talking about this also. In an otherwise normal pregnancy, is echocardiography indicated? Now you see, in circulation, they produced a paper in circulation on, they wanted to, the Sue et al. in 1997 produced this paper, risk predictors for pregnancy-related complications in women with, uh, with heart disease, CARPREG scoring system, it was called. The scoring system was developed and validated. The system was based on the information easily obtainable by a detailed history, physical examination, and echocardiogram. That means how will they evaluate this patient? They have the, every patient has to, you have to do a echocardiogram to develop the, the system. Now you see in, this is from the European Society of Cardiology Registry of Pregnancy and Cardiac Disease. Pregnancy outcomes in women with cardiovascular disease, evolving trends over 10 years. Preg one and preg two studies were conducted. These two studies were conducted. And you see, there were a cohort of around 5,700 patients, pregnant mothers with cardiac disease, with all four levels of the NYHA classifications of uh, 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 risk status. And to my surprise, there were 73%, 73% of them, that is 4,200 patients were in NYHA class one. Now, NYHA class one is what? Let's see what is NYHA class one. Means that there are no limitations. Ordinary physical activity does not cause undue fatigue. Dyspnea or palpitation, they, are, they have asymptomatic LV dysfunction. That means that all of their normal pregnant mothers, so in them, if you don't do an echocardiogram, you tend to miss them. 73% of this study group, cardiology, the cardiac disease would have been missed had, had they not done an echocardiography in all the patients who were in, in the study. We all know that cardiac output, heart rate, stroke volume, all of them change in pregnancy. We know it very nicely and they can produce decompensation in an otherwise compensated patient. So all these things can happen. Cardiac output in mid-trimester pregnancy reaches maximum. During labor delivery, it increases. Immediately following delivery, there is autotransfusion, the cable compression is taken off, and all these things increase the load on the heart and an otherwise compensated patient, a normal patient would have ended in compensated decompensation. Had we not made a diagnosis, well in advance and taken precautionary measures. Now, Braun, Braun Waltz, in his textbook on heart disease, in the first chapter itself, he writes, clinically undetectable cardiac lesions. You know, what are those clinically undetectable cardiac diseases? Mild valvular lesions of the heart, mild congenital cardiac diseases, 
and early cardiomyopathy are not detectable clinically, then how else will you detect them? You have to detect them by echocardiography. This is the good practice uh, uh, books on Royal College of uh, RCOG, cardiac disease in pregnancy. <clears throat> Mitral valve stenosis, the most common lesion and, the, and carries the highest risk is a difficult clinical diagnosis. And there should be a low threshold to do an echocardiogram, they, they say. Now, <clears throat> okay, let's see what are the early symptoms of postpartum cardiomyopathy. This is postpartum cardiomyopathy, oh, sorry, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Mild breathlessness, mild pedal edema, mild tachycardia. Now, these are the symptoms of, early symptoms of peripartum cardiomyopathy. We are supposed to pick up the peripartum cardiomyopathy in this, at this stage. You show me one pregnant mother, full-term mother, who visits an obstetrician at that time, who do not give this particular, these symptoms. So, if you don't do an echocardiography, you would definitely miss all those 4,700 patients who are asymptomatic and would not develop, probably would end up and develop the complications. That is when you make the diagnosis. You see, in Canada, there is one proverb. That means this is a fort, you see. The fort is built to protect the people inside, right? And there is a, this is the uh, main door for the fort. Now, after the, the fort is completely robbed, they close this door itself. And this is what happens if you don't do an echocardiogram and get in uh, and reach a stage wherein the patient develops a uh, congestive heart failure, decompensation, and then you make a diagnosis. Now about availability and accessibility. This is Shumaga way back in 1996 when I reached uh, the place. This is a, a district place, district uh, place. And uh, uh, we never had any opportunity to reach, uh, uh, you know, have, have an echocardiogram at that time. Mangalore was the ne nearest place, 200 kilometers. People have to travel to Mangalore to get an echocardiogram. Today, it is not like that. Today, with around 320,000 population in Shimoga, there are more than 97 places where an echocardiography can be done. So accessibility, availability, that is also not a big problem. British Journal of Anesthesiology says that echocardiography is a safe, non-invasive test and underused in pregnancy. This is in, uh, in 2004 itself, he says that it is underused in pregnancy. And this was the final one. Kesser et al. in their echocardiography in, in pregnant women in his textbook writes, since echocardiography is a safe and uh, you know, useful test, will probably remain a, a, for a long time in the patient monitoring in pregnant women. So, echo in pregnancy, it is safe, it is necessary, but you may not be doing it as a routine because it may not be accessible to you, everyone at all. I rest my case. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, thank you. And I congratulate Dr. Ravindra for uh, excellently putting up the presentation defending uh, need for echocardiography for all patients who are undergoing elective cesarean section. Thank you, Dr. Ravindra is my good friend. I know his uh, vocabulary <laughs> capacities and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks to Dr. Sunil Panda and his organizing team. Uh, and I wish again everybody a good conference and a lot of uh, take home things. And I'm going to say why there is no need or not possible to do echocardiography in all the patients who are going uh, to go undergo elective cesarean section. Uh, greetings from KSAGDA Medical Academy, Nita University, Kshema. As per our uh, national logo of uh, Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, it is uh, eternal vigilance which is required and it is a price of uh, safety. We all know that uh, and we all watch over our patient. However, when it comes to the issue of echocardiography for all patients undergoing uh, elective caesarean section, let us consider the indications which have already been uh, iterated by Dr. Ravindra. They are very clear. These are the conditions where you need to do echocardiography and there is enough evidence to say that it is a requirement and it has to be repeated periodically. Yes. And it is also clear that when the patient has these symptoms, which are chest pain, dyspnea address, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, syncope, 
sustained palpitation symptoms starting and progressively in worsening after 20 weeks of gestation definitely diastolic murmur heart rate more than 100 bpm he said tachycardia but he did not clarify what is tachycardia and then of course cyanosis clubbing rails and s4 gallop and all these things are definitely indication for echocardiography and there is no doubt about it then comes the uh, different uh, guidelines and studies which he quoted capreg study modified who guidelines are there zohara guidelines are there all these guidelines are essentially for the patients who have known cardiac illness or cardiac illness is detected in the due course of pregnancy generally by symptoms or close physical examination and these pregnant women invariably are in contact with the gynecologist for uh, the good part of nine months and at least they have uh, five to ten visits during these times and there is ample time to detect su suspicious signs and symptoms of uh, cardiac illness and they are free to undergo echocardiography during any time of their pregnancy. And of course, there is a well laid out uh, algorithm from uh, American Cardiac Foundation, American College of Cardiac Foundation, uh, stepwise approach to preoperative cardiac evaluation. And it clearly says, of, after excluding all things, consider testing if it will change the management. There's further testing in case of cardiac illness is only when there is possibility of change in the management. So there is no need for just any investigation. It has to be uh, justified by the possibility of change in the management. Further, let us accept Dr. Ravindra's argument. He beautifully argued and established that echocardiography is required and we are doing it. And how, what are we doing? See, in every year in India, we have about 2.5 crore births and about 40 lakh cesarean sections and about 21% uh, of them are elective and 78% uh, are emergency. Now consider we are doing elective cesarean sections, uh, echocardiographies for all the patients because they, we know that this particular patient is undergoing LSES, so we have time to do it. Then we are adding about 10 lakh, 10 lakh uh, patients for echocardiography. I will come to the possibility of how many times you do echocardiography in each of these patients. But we are adding another 10 lakh echocardiographies to the whole amount of echocardiographies done in the country. He said it is accessible, available, affordable, all thing is right. But I don't agree with that every patient is affordable to the echocardiography and accessibility also. Still question, large population in our country lies outside the urban, that is about 60% of the population still reside in the village and making them affordability and accessibility is a big problem. Then comes what about this emergency cesarean sections who are at higher risk than elective cases? Why are you leaving out the <clears throat> most vulnerable population and hold on to who are easily manageable? There comes the problem and we are also seeing a trend towards increasing number of cesarean sections as year advances from 15% Earlier now it is about uh, 20 to 25 percent, some areas it is up to 40 percent as you can see here. So we are adding, right now we are adding 10 lakh patients more and you compare that to the number of uh, echocardiograms performed by, per year in United States, it is about 31 million echocardiographies. We are adding another million or two uh, to that number. Maybe India may be also having similar number but there is no data. So I am quoting US uh, numbers. And if you add emergency cesarean sections, then you add the all pregnancies, then it is a dangerous slippery slope where you have to do echocardiography for 2.5 crore population every year. And just imagine the load on the cardiologists, load on the technicians, and load on the patients. How many billions of rupees they have to shell out to do this echocardiography. And interestingly, a interesting analysis found that 30% of the procedures and especially echocardiographies are rarely appropriate in uh, major abdominal surgeries. That means 30% of the times we are simply testing the patient and spending the money and time and energy. And it is clearly said that uh, routine screening interval during pregnancy for various cardiac lesions are not very less safe, either ultrasound or echocardiography, they are very safe. However, <clears throat> they are not uh, going to be useful unless it is a well-defined condition and this heterogeneity is coming, reducing the usefulness of the studies.
our idea is to diagnose the clinical manifestation at the earliest so there are changes happening as dr ravindra described and there are a lot of inflection points as you can witness here at 20th week 24th week 28th week 34th week or at the time of delivery and post delivery are you going to do ultrasound and echocardiography every inflection point or going to reserve it only for the cesarean section because you have to catch the, the patient early catch them young the still it is not manifested so you have to repeat several times just imagine the amount of work you are multiplying then coming to logistics of this echocardiography we are all good at doing echocardiography in a supine patient but in a pregnant lady you can't afford to put them in supine and get inferior vena compressed and make them symptomatic and treat them then thereafter coming to peripartum cardiomyopathy which is the crux of the problem where we have to really work hard because all other situations are either diagnosed prepartum i mean uh, pre pregnancy pre conceptual period or during pregnancy and they become overt but this peripartum cardiomyopathy which manifests in the last month of pregnancy or just after delivery for few months and onset is uh, generally new symptoms during late pregnancy here is a very important aspect of early diagnosis the incidence is 1 in 3734 live births that is about 1 and 1000 deliveries one patient has got a symptom and if you search all this 1000 1 and 1000 patients doing echocardiography you are searching needle in a haystack and some of them become over it even before you start searching and they, this uh, ppcm has well defined risk factors i am not going to deal with them in detail and if you know the risk factors you can definitely subject this patient to echocardiography and the mechanisms are well known that is abnormal prolactin metabolism and angiogenic imbalance and we have markers for that and thereby we have specific markers which can be tested repeatedly and once we once these markers become uh, popular it is very easy to detect pp it is very easy to diagnose even without doing an uh, echocardiography and it is very, we must remember that they are safe techniques echocardiography and mri and all those things but uh, they should be only used if expected to answer a relevant clinical question or otherwise provide medical benefit to the patient simply doing in 1773 1, sorry patients and 74th patient is only getting positive then what is the use then american college of cardiology explicitly states during covid pandemic that these are the symptoms where you have to do electro electrocardiographic or echocardiographic uh, uh, situations investigations and examinations if they have signs and symptoms arrhythmias or have ecg changes otherwise please don't do them because you are Uh, causing a risk to the healthcare facility as well as to the patient to summarize ppcm is rare post peripartum cardiomyopathy is rare and um, the electro uh, echocardiography is a uh, uh, time and uh, uh, human resource intensive procedure you have large numbers to cater to and how many are going to detect it is very few one in uh, one and a half thousand patients and thus uh, if you sub and all other patients with the previous cardiac disease are generally diagnosed before and and they undergo the elective uh, investigative procedures by the time they reach you there is no need for doing this unless you have clear cut evidence of cardiac illness like the signs and symptoms already iterated or ecg changes hence please reserve these investigations for the needy and don't be greedy thank you very much thanks for being here so when did you uh, approach your patient or how did you get the information that patient is having do you have a system that during the stay of your hospital uh, somebody informs you that uh, the patient is having pdph or if the patient goes away from hospital uh, so when do you initiate your uh, procedure and what drug therapy do you use so uh, as a protocol all patients uh, would be assessed the subsequent day uh, when they have delivered or they have a cesarean section a resident would go and evaluate them and interview them uh, most of them would be actually found during that uh, time or if let's say the patient has delivered uh, the residents go evaluate every early, uh, every other day early morning so if they had symptoms they have symptoms before they can always reach out but they would not be discharged until day 3 anyways so we would be able to detect most of those uh, 
uh, patients. And sir, what the, drugs do you start? Yeah, the, the commonest what we use here is a combination of um, uh, NSAIDs and oxycodone. Uh, and uh, this is given to, I would say, most of the patients. And uh, we try to be conservative wherever we can. And like I said, you know, if uh, somebody has early onset post dual puncture headache, we have a lower threshold to use the blood patch there. Okay. And, uh, Dr. and we Dika use cosentropin. Asked... We would start cosentropin uh, uh, if we have a, uh, uh, a known wet tap with the epidural needle. We will uh, prophylactically okay. start cosentropin on almost everybody. Okay. Okay. And your results with cosentropin, sir, how's it? So uh, they actually, it's very hard to say because uh, 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 the numbers, you know, it's all yes. anecdotal that we have, you know, it's actually, we find that the numbers are lower. And in fact, all the studies that actually looked at it uh, as well reported the same. So yes, uh, we think that it, it does uh, reduce the incidence uh, quite a bit. Okay. And uh, uh, it comes with, it doesn't come in a single vial. It's a multi-dose vial or... You discard no, it so you've got, uh, there are two ways of representing the dosages, like uh, you've got, it's, it's either used as milligrams or used as units, you know, so what we use is milligrams is run as a slow infusion, uh, you give like five to 10 milligrams over six to eight hours as an infusion. It generally is started as soon as the baby is delivered, we typically don't start it, you could start it early as well, but the problem is that the clearances for the drug with the baby in uh, is not, uh, I mean, it could become a potential problem. So we started as soon as the, the mother delivers. Okay. And uh, Dr. Gita has asked one question. Is it Dutch uh, PDPH predisposes to the cerebral uh, sinus thrombosis? Not really cerebral. Uh, I know I rushed through the slide, but uh, it doesn't uh, uh, predispose to cerebral sinus thrombosis. What it does predispose is to hemorrhagic complications, but uh, cerebral sinus thrombosis is something uh, uh, of a differential diagnosis and would present as a, uh, a, a severe headache, but uh, uh, PDPH predisposes to hemorrhagic complications rather than thrombotic complications. Okay. And uh, really, it is really difficult when we find the cases of PDPH. Recently, we had one patient. Uh, she left uh, to home. We had been uh, uh, we had been discussing like, are you having PDPH during her stay in a hospital? But after the ten days, she rang up. Then she said that I'm having mm -hmm. severe headache. But the thing is that when I uh, when I uh, lay down, I feel uh, uh, more headache, and when I sit, I feel relief. So they said it's not a PDPH, but uh, the but the obstetricians. Uh, still mm -hmm. uh, refer those cases as PDPH and uh, we have to explain them. And uh, when mm -hmm. we uh, looked at her blood pressure, uh, uh, her sleep was not adequate. Her blood pressure was 150 by 110. Then again, we have to treat her in that line. But that's also important. And uh, I feel like uh, what is the, uh, how, at till what time the uh, anesthetist could be held liable for the PDPH, sir? What do you think? What time frame? Well, I did. Uh, uh, I did. I mean, this is not an uncommon situation. Actually, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, before I moved to the US in 2018, before this, I was an attending at Ames, New Delhi. So I know what uh, uh, the work culture is in India versus the West now. Uh, I think our follow-ups uh, are uh, much more stringent here. And what happens is we still get patients like exactly the same situation where you, you'd get a call from the patient after day 10 and the obstetrician thinks, oh, it's just the anesthesiologist to be blamed. It's like throughout the world, it has not changed uh, anywhere. But I would say that uh, I would, in such a scenario where I'm past uh, five to seven days, I would ask for a neurology opinion. It's not that it's absolutely uncommon. Like I did mention, you know, we, we had, I mean, there have been cases even after years, which have strangely been reported uh, uh, as post dual puncture headaches, but they had to undergo a lot of investigations to rule out everything uh, before they could be labeled. But if somebody calls me after day 10, I would be very hesitant to, to label that patient as post dual puncture headache. I would definitely go in with an MRI and a neurology opinion before I do anything. Uh, that's that's uh, very- Yeah, yeah Preet, I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so do you use penopelatine ganglion block as a as a uh, you know conservative measure, conservative treatment for PDPH uh, well, before you embark on maybe blood patch or something like that? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, the biggest uh, winner for you uh, for a patient uh, would be that you know I mean when you actually talk about a new block here in the U.S. Uh, compared to India, I can tell you people are really really. 
you know, questioning things, what you're going to do. So I remember the first time we did this block, I had to show it on myself. Uh, and uh, it is a very docile block. There's nothing that it, you can cause a, as a problem. And it, where it works, it works wonders. You know, I've seen patients uh, go from a VAS of nine to maybe two in like 20 minutes, you know. The, the, the downside is you have to repeat it for uh, every six to eight hours, but uh, you could potentially avoid blood patch. And we often think, you know, we should be done with the, the patient, do the blood patch and you're, you're good. But blood patch is like a, a thing which you should avoid as much as you can because you potentially could cause more problems as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, according to the polling, uh, what we have found is that and the echocardiography, 20% uh, people are saying that echocardiography should be done routinely uh, before the elective cesarean section, that is a pro section uh, by Dr. Ravindra. And 80% uh, of our doctor population has said that echocardiography should not be routinely done in all the uh, cases before an elective cesarean section. Ravindra, you lost your deposit also. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I know. <laughs> Can I just make a comment? I mean, I was, uh, it was a very interesting pro and con debate. I don't, what I see difference uh, in here is that we all do bedside echoes, you know, I mean, as okay. an anesthesiologist, rather than when you talked about, we were, we were probably heading towards, you know, sending them to cardiology, but you could actually do a bedside echo, which I would say would make your threshold uh, go very low. Now you're right, Preet, but the problem is, that the PCPNDT Act will not allow you know. to, yes, possess, yeah, yeah. even possess the uh, uh, instrument. Yeah. So that is no, the problem. I, agree. I mean, in fact, I bought the Butterfly Probe. I don't know whether you heard. So it's a probe that hooks up to your iPhone. In US, it's easier. I was actually bringing it to India, thinking, you know, I could show it to my friends that, you know, how easy it is. But then they told me, actually, you could be held legally responsible for this probe with you because of the PNDT Act. Yeah. From my airport, you would have gone straight to the jail. <laughs> yeah, luckily I didn't get it. So, okay. uh, this PCP entity is a big problem for us. Yes. Otherwise, even for uh, doing your routine and no blocks, you need to have a special permission from the authorities, and you have to always producing. No, the, no, I know. Uh, I was I actually yeah. trained at Ames before I moved, so I was uh, attending at post uh, PGI Chandigarh and Ames before I moved to the US. So I I I did not recollect that. Oh, you know, PNDT could actually come in for. Uh, this probe as well, but yes, uh, I, I understand. It makes a huge difference. And it is not licensed in India yet because of this reason. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Ketan, can we uh, close this session?